Hello, everybody. I am here today to talk with you about future librarians. As the world becomes increasingly digital, we're required to know how to use digital tools, but especially for the lowest income communities and families, access to skill building programs to learn digital skills are few and far between. In this world, I see now two trends. One is that access to information is increasing, while the accessibility of information is actually on the decline. What's the difference? Technically, most Americans have access to computers and internet. Accessibility involves how we use those digital tools. So for example, in rural Minnesota, where we're working with the National Libraries of Medicine, it's not uncommon to see folks huddled around outside of a library after hours to try and get a Wi-Fi signal. We've even seen folks proctor exams uh, sitting on the sidewalks. That's an access challenge. Here's an accessibility example. So in Detroit, some of the families that we've been working with have had their utilities cut off since this plan, the Low Income Self-Sufficiency Plan, has moved from in-person to web-based application processes. A lot of the families we work with do have a cell phone, they do have cellular data, but they don't know how to find these forms or how to fill them out. That's, to me, an accessibility challenge. And especially in the winter, the librarians we work with get inundated with these questions. At Libraries Without Borders, our mission is to expand both access and accessibility of information. And how do we do this? So I'll give you one example. In 2015, we pitched an idea to the New York Public Library to work with us to build pop-up digital classrooms and libraries in the South Bronx. We started by building out programs in public parks and moved to lobbies of low-income housing, legal aid waiting offices, hospital waiting rooms, churches, community centers, subway stations. And what we found was that the best, best, best spot to build these programs was outside of the laundromat. <laughs> and it seems pretty obvious, right? It's a time when families are almost necessarily they have to go weekly. It's a time when you have 90 minutes or so while you're waiting for your laundry to wash and dry. And for us, this was a really exciting find because a lot of these families are the ones that have fallen through the cracks of other social service systems and required us to, in the past, do expensive home visits to be able to get back into our programs. So with this learning from the South Bronx, we built something called uh, the Wash and Learn Initiative. Here's a photo from uh, one of our programs in Detroit. It's now a national program that we are working on to not only build out, as you can see, not only build out bookshelves with curated texts for families to take home and materials from our partners like Too Small to Fail for parents uh, to learn more about early learning, but also building in curated Wi-Fi hotspots that go in the back office of the laundromat so that people can use their own cell phone devices to learn about new education technologies, and also with uh, laptops and computers installed. But most, most, most importantly, I think, the reason why this program has been successful is that we've been working with local libraries to convene any and every local nonprofit to bring their programs to these laundromat libraries at the laundromat's busiest times. So whereas a lot of programs have had to spend a lot of resources on outreach and recruitment and enrollment, if we design them in a way that fits between wash and dry cycles on Saturdays and Sundays and in the evenings, 
we don't need to do any kind of outreach. So what are the barriers, though, that, that this is really overcoming? Why is this program successful? I think that uh, the first one is a scheduling barrier. So in Detroit, one of the women that had participated in our program and not come back after the second session, I asked her, you know, what feedback can you give us to, to make this more accessible for you? And I was expecting her to tell us some stories or feedback on the curriculum design or the pedagogical methodology. But what she said to us was, she works in a restaurant. She gets her schedules on Sundays. It's different every week. Our program at the library was meeting on Wednesdays at 6 PM. And if we have a consistently scheduled program, it's very, very hard for folks who work in service industries to be able to make it. She dropped out of the third session because it conflicted with one of her shifts. She couldn't afford to miss that shift. She was embarrassed that she dropped out and hasn't signed up for another professional development program since. Second, I think there are skills barriers. And what I mean by this are, you know, as the world is becoming and, and holding people responsible to not only ask but answer their own questions online, who are, who are who is teaching these people how to, and everyone, how to have the basic literacy, digital literacy, information literacy, and media literacy skills to do so effectively? And most complicated, and, and I think this, this deserves a whole talk on its own, there are psychosocial barriers. Um, with, with this crowd, I'll, I'll give this example, which is, uh, when we think about why CrossFit or SoulCycle is, is so popular and why people are paying so much money for it, I don't necessarily think that it's because by enrolling in those classes, you're learning a new skill or a new technique each class. I think that there's something around the social community and the social support network around that that, that you're really paying for. Right? But if you are in a low-income community, a low-literacy community, what are your social support networks that help you as a lifelong learner? In the same way that a private trainer, fitness trainer, might be really working with you with pep talks and, and, and talking you through how to reimagine your, your identity as, a, as an athlete, who are the ones that are helping folks who might be intimidated by Yale, by libraries, to reimagine themselves as lifelong learners? So we have uh, <laughs> my three bullet points written in black on this board. So um, we have our three barriers, scheduling barriers, skills barriers, psychosocial barriers, to make up what I'm calling accessibility barriers to information. At Libraries Without Borders, we have been breaking these barriers down at local levels. We do this through programs like Wash and Learn, We've run programs with UNHCR in refugee camps, in Colombia with XFARC in demobilization zones, in Greece and Italy with migrants, in homeless shelters in France. Each of these, I think we've, we've done a lot of thought and inclusive designs around how to make information more accessible for those particular communities. But I think the bigger question to ask for all of us is how do we take those best practices and think about how to break down accessibility barriers systemically. To answer that, I think the first question we need to ask is, who do we trust to be responsible for, that, for, for breaking down those barriers? Is it private companies who are going to be most efficient at it, but might not be able to move themselves away from the business structures that hold them accountable to their advertisers. There's a Pew Research poll that says that um, more people trust their local librarian than any national newspaper, any local newspaper, or even a local, their own health provider. I think there's something that we can build from that to really, and really leverage that trust 
to be doing something here. I think that the person, the people, that we should be holding responsible and giving authority to, to do this work, are our public librarians. Today in library school, you're not just learning how to stack books, sign people up for library cards. The best library schools are teaching human-centered design. They're teaching information technology. Librarians around the country are doing everything from being right now at the front line of the opioid crisis to revitalizing Native American languages, offering 24-7 homework help, signing people up for email accounts. I think that we should be putting more of our trust in these future librarians. Here's another example. So in Idaho, librarians offer a program with resources provided by the National Library Services to help blind and visually impaired gain access to audiobooks and other technologies. Here in Connecticut, the law library actually provides digital resources for folks who are representing themselves pro se in courts, which, as you know, are some of the most vulnerable folks in our communities. Both of these and many other programs like these that are making information more accessible are currently at the threat of being cut because the federal government's, um, the, the federal administration's proposed new budget cuts funding to libraries completely. No funding for libraries at all. Campaigns like Every Library, which is our small and uh, scrappy library super PAC, are not just fighting for the re bringing back and revitalization of this nostalgic idea of bookshelves. Library advocates like every library, like Libraries Without Borders, what we're trying to do is to put more resources and give more resources to local trusted experts who are innovating, dynamically innovating solutions to information access and accessibility challenges in their own communities. I think that as we move into a, an increasingly digital age, what we're doing right now with libraries is creating an army of information warriors. The theme of this TEDx event is uncharted. And more than ever, I think we're moving into an uncharted territory of misinformation. In that space, Librarians have a more important role to play than ever. Librarians will be the ones that work alongside big tech firms, apps, algorithms that currently aren't working at fighting against these misinformation campaigns to be dynamically creating culturally, emotionally, and socially sensitive innovations and solutions to these information challenges. To me, that is the present, the past, and the future librarian. Thank you. Thank you.